So yeah, we are squatters and we are proud of squatters, but you know, it's had so much negative media press. At the end of the day, you know, a lot of us would actually be on the street. I mean, in a way, we kind of chose to get into this this sort of world of squatting. And they think it's pejorative. I don't give a fuck, like. It's like ridiculous opinion that like they shit on the floor. That's bullshit. Obviously, it's like yeah, they think we would start drug takers and all that stuff. Like, you know, just want to like get on in it. You know? Okay, sex and six of the Criminal Law Act 1977 basically just says that if somebody is in a building and doesn't want you to come in, you can't force entry unless you have some legal authority to do so. And that is what we use to um, stop landlords, etc., breaking into a squat and removing people. Hi, I'm uh, Gary Cooper. Hello, I'm Sammy. Sammy? No, Sam. I don't even know now, I mean, over five years at least. Um, so, I mean, I started sort of, uh, when I was uh, back in the stone market up near Ipswich, um, which is quite a long time ago. Like, and then, you know, I got introduced to them, and that's kind of where it all started really from there. So. I started squatting in September, yeah, recently. Yeah, I started really, squatting maples, and then this number four. Yeah, definitely the best one. Uh, hi, my name's Phoenix. Uh, I've been squatting about 18 odd years. Um, basically, for a lot of years, since about the 1992 Rio Earth Summit, we've been setting up, setting up uh, squatted environment community centres or social centres, various different buildings, recycling them into uh, basically a voluntary run community centre where people can get together, meet other people and do stuff about the environment. Well, I sort of like, on and off, like, I usually have like other places to crash for like, probably about like three years. I, I got sick of just living at home and like, I didn't get on my mum. It was like, it was great. I'm Sol. Um, I've been squatting for very long. This is the first uh, permanent squat I've been living in, really. Yeah. That's a little uh, community thing going on, that's nice. Um, I'm Holly Jade. I'm a performance artist, a writer, um, and I believe in creating your own reality and the right to create your own reality. Um, I'm inspired by the Beat Generation and the Libertarians, and then going back to the Pagans as well. Um, I'm interested in magic and in creating magic and not necessarily following any rules or any systems. Sometimes you don't want to straight away put across who you are because people have a straight away, they have a stigma with, oh, you're squirting, so you must be kind of, you know, people are going to have parties all night and you're just going to be like sleeping on dirty mattresses in the corner and wrecking a place and this and that. And it's kind of, I mean, you see from this place, it's, you know, completely the opposite. So you sometimes got to judge who the people are and then, okay, yeah, no, we are squirting. And I think you'll understand what we're doing as opposed to just claiming straight out who we are. And then people go, oh, no, 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 well, we're just going to like completely ignore you. We don't like you already just because you've you've done that, it's like, but you don't even know who we are. <laughs> you haven't given yourself the chance to, to you know, to actually meet the people that you're, uh, you're, you're putting a stigma to. So, um, one of my friends was squatting, I met Jeff, Gary, and some other people, <laughs> and um, sort of started, yeah, I don't know, I was working and living in Bedfordshire, and I found that each month all my money that I was earning, working so hard, for what was going on to all my bills, council tax, rent, everything. So, um, yeah, uh, press the restart button and changed my life, and now I'm here and loving it, really. Yeah. Right, just move out and just like, normally it's like more up North London, but then this place is a lot closer to where I work, so it's like, yeah, just crash here when I need to. I don't have like a set bedroom here, but I know if I ever need a place to crash, I can just like sleep in like the front room place, and whatever. No money. Um, my mum hasn't got any money. I don't know my dad, and it's not like I can fall back on the pocket of mummy and daddy after I left uni. I love my job so much, but it's really it's creative when I work like a bitch. Like pretty much six days a week, but there's no money on it. I'm um, but on less than minimum wage. 
And so I worked in music PR for a couple of years when I graduated and I got paid fuck all for that as well. I uh, could hardly afford to live, got in loads and loads of debt. So it just had to, just necessity really, financial necessity if I want to live in London and do a job that I love. So most people squat because they desperately need somewhere to live, they've run out of money, they're skint, they haven't got the money for a deposit, mortgage, rent, whatever it is, um, and for one reason or another they lose where they're having to stay and they end up staying on friends' floors or out on the street or whatever. Um, so, you know, the vast majority of people squatting are squatting because they are in urgent, desperate need of housing. You know, there are a much smaller percentage of people who do it because they want to do it for a cause or for the environment or for projects. I'm kind of a, a project squatter, I suppose you could say, as well. I mean, you know, I squat. I got into squatting, well, maybe I said earlier, but basically I was living with three students who all wanted to go back for the summer and I lost my deposit, I was working, and basically the, um, the estate agent said, oh, didn't you read the small print? Unless you stay in here for a year, we only give you a deposit back after a year. So I lost my 300 quid deposit, and that was it. I was on 100 quid a week, or whatever the less, whatever it was, and I couldn't afford to pay a deposit, so I ended up sleeping on some mate's work's floor for a while, ended up on the street for a while, and then some mates said, oh, we're squatting somewhere in King's Cross, do you want to come stay in the lounge? I was like, yeah, great. And then me and my mate Dave, Basically ended up finding a two-bedroom flat, empty in Mornington Crescent, found the window open, got in, got a little squatter's handbook and went, this is a changer, yeah, lot, right, take them three off and get a new barrel and you put that in and you do it up again and wow, we've got our own lock on the door, wow, we've got the squat, yeah, and we're like 19, chuffed, we're there, get our mates around, eat toast, draw on the walls and, you know, have a few smokes, a few drinks or whatever, you know, and uh, it was great and we had someone to live, you know. So, like... So mates, like we used to have a place um, in Hampton Wick. We sort of like me and all the punks sort of like cracked first, and uh, like we sort of semi squatted it, but we're all a bit useless. So um, we knew like the kind of like hippie lot down here, and like they sort of like started living it. And then like we always had a place to go there, and then like we sort of like all cracked this place. And it's sort of like yeah, we were there, and we just, like grab a bedroom. Start living here. Went to my mate's squat, just started hanging out with them. Ended up moving in with them and then moving here. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, I go to college in Kingston. Uh, so I'm not just fucking doing shit all with my life. Like, yeah. So, in the end of my second year now, uh, got into Middlesex Uni recently, which is pretty cool. Well, uh, I've got a job. Uh, I work as a lifeguard just pretty much down the road at Brentford Swimming Pool, so that's why this place is so handy because. I can just like leave my bike here, no matter how pissed I can get. Like, I can just walk five minutes to go to work. And then like weekdays and things like, like weekdays just come here, just have a quiet drink and then like usually the weekend just go like have a bit of a mad one, like probably up in central. Yeah, yeah, yeah like, I do both most of my photography about like uh, squatting lifestyles and stuff like that, you know. Yeah, alternative lifestyles. <laughs> It's, yeah, because like, because like, my mum's yard is like just down in Ham, and like this is like the most local squat that we've had, apart from the place we had in like um, Hampton Wick that got that like got closed down about two months ago. This place is just easier because it's like it is very hard to find squats like in Southwest London, like most of them are in North London and like completely crappy ends, and like to find this place is in like really good condition like and it's just really close to where I work so I don't have to like travel for, like 45 minutes to get to work if I stay at a squat where here is like 10 minutes down the road. You live with a good bunch of people right? you always like get your own little family going on when you're living in a squat so yeah nice people so everyone gets on and stuff so yeah it's cool. But I think this building has been empty for about 12 years or something um it's had a couple of squats here before but nothing major. Okay. And I had the neighbours from the flats across the road and they were quite interested to see what we were like. And they said that they'd done loads of research into squatters and Park Lane and how all of that went and everything. I just thought that was going to be us. But we had got quite a few people staying here at the moment. Like the other night we had about 20, nearly 20 people here. Just because um, some people that we used to squat have got evicted and they have nowhere to go, so they've come and they're crashing here and got five kittens as well and a cat which is really cute I don't know where they are 
I always really liked derelict buildings when I was younger, and my friend Megan, who's also Scotting now, also did, and we used to love sort of like looking at them and going into them and exploring. So I don't think I ever really knew what Scotting was, but I don't know, there must have been something. And dreams, I don't know, just generally, sometimes if you're around that sort of thing, it just happened. Mm. I don't think I would have thought about it when I was young. I mean, to be honest, I was too busy being young and just running around as a kid. And but I mean, as he got a bit older, I mean, I, I pretty much went the, the route of getting a, getting a good job. I mean, getting paid a decent amount of money for doing something I'd learned at college and going so far to the point where I kind of started getting bored of doing the job. Although it was something I, I kind of wanted to do and that I trained to do, I just started going, well, I'm not really doing anything. I've got no social um, contact with really a lot of people. I used to drive around the country a lot fixing a lot of sort of tracking systems and things like that. And, I just got to the point where I was like, I can't, I really can't do this anymore, you know. And then, then started to be more aware. I mean, I was aware of it a little bit younger. I mean, everyone remembers Swampy and all that. I'm sure he used to be on like Blue Peep and stuff, you know, doing them more of the protest and sort of thing. But it, like I said, it kind of all kicked in a bit when when it came down to like seeing this old woodland that used to play in like being a housing estate kind of thing. And and then like looking into the details and finding out, okay, so it's a housing estate, but it's not for local people because the houses are like 140 grand plus or something like that. So that then started going on from, okay, so we can do a bit of protesting. So start getting involved with people, like I said, in Stonemarker, who were actually uh, squatting to protest against, obviously, this this road that was being built and, the, the, and this woman who was, was going to end up getting forced out on her own sort of thing. And then it just progressed from there into actually choosing to be part of uh, that, that style of, uh, of life as opposed to just kind of dipping in here and there every so often. And, and that's kind of where it went from there. And all I did is just learn a lot more about it, basically. I work as a stylist and work as a personal assistant, marketing and entertainment manager and then I'm trying to do a lot of writing and then that's with one of, I work with two places like Prankster and then with the Come Come Yum Yum show we're starting up a travelling central circus and so with that I am also marketing and entertainment manager. I've lived in about nine places I think since I started squatting. Yeah. Different groups of people but the same often circuit of friends and then I find that with squatting it gives you a lot of freedom and a lot of my friends are adventurers and so they don't really want to stay in one place for that long. Well like I've only probably started like actually sort of staying nights like quite regularly at squats for like past couple of years but like I've been like going to squat parties and like just sleep where you pass out since I was like 13, 14 just like getting into the punk scenes. Well there's this place called uh, SS but it's not, not, I didn't find out about it through, through the SS but one of my friends like had found a squat basically on, there's this place called the SS and it's, like a, it's a meeting ground for people who want to squat or people who need legal advice and some help or and also there's vacancies that are put up in different squats around London um, and you can go to that, that and get some advice or if you need to move into a squat they'll link you with somewhere. Um, I'm Mike Zietlin, I am one of the volunteers at ASS. I would mainly give legal and some practical advice on squatting, um, making sure people know that squatting is still legal and possible, most importantly. Um, we do a lot of explaining to authorities that squatting is still legal and that it's nothing to do with police, etc. Most of the time police are fine, but um, there's, there's times when they try things on. Um, and yeah, lots of landlords don't understand squatting. And yeah, in 77 they brought in the new law and at the same time it was worded in such a way that, that we could use it. Mainly I think it came from being politically active. Um, doing, I mean I remember going up to an old uh, woodland that I used to play in as a kid. I to go and show a friend of mine like years and years later and it was a housing estate which kind of started getting me thinking and then we got into the uh, the idea of occupying spaces 
um, either for protest um, or you know obviously for, for living all that and then it came about obviously that squatting could actually be used as a, as, as, as a kind of way of protesting as such and also a way to home people because at the end of the day there's a lot of spaces I mean, I mean, for this place, for example, it's been empty for fifteen years. I mean, it, had, it hasn't. Nobody's wanted to rent it. Nothing's going on with the property. Um, it's literally just being left to fall down. I mean, we've looked into the details of this place, and this the guys, um, the guy just basically wants to knock it down and build flats on it. And obviously, nobody in the area wants that to happen. He's just left it. We're not here to to really sort of screw you over. We're just trying to make a point that you can't kind of leave all these buildings empty. I mean. I can't remember, I think the last rough figures that I heard were like 1.4 million people homeless and 1.7 million properties empty. And, you know, you do the maths. It's like there's still loads of properties empty and everyone's been home. So I just think it's a really, really bad thing. Um, I mean, I've, I've gone past many people who, um, you know, literally live on the street and I've gone, do you know what Section 6 is? Do you know about squatting? They're like, don't have a clue. I'm like, right, well, here you go. Look up this or read about this. Go and use it, you know, because at the end of the day, you're on the street. It's cold. And do you want to know how to make a wood burner out of a couple of, a couple of oil cans so you can keep yourself warm in a place that, you know, even if it doesn't have electric or doesn't have anything, you know, it gets people off of the street. And it is, and it is, a, is a method to, you know, to, to make sure that people aren't just uh, wasting properties. I mean, what's the point in having a table that's not being used as a table and a chair that's not being used as a te- chair? What's the point in a house that's not homing people? Or, you know, so I think it's just a really big point to make sure that people are utilising these things. I mean, somebody put a big effort into this place to, to make it what it is and it's just sitting empty. One part of me is very proud to be a squatter because I feel that, you know, the whole privatising of land and chucking people off to, you know, is, is not such a good thing. But and there's a long, long history, actually, you know, the whole concept of private property isn't, you know, isn't actually that old. Uh, Breton law talks about, uh, old law in Ireland and the Breton countries talked about clan ownership of land and community ownership of land like you know, the grandmothers, the elders, and the whole village clan would look after a piece of land. And the English came in in the 1500s or whatever and slaughtered loads of people and brought in one man can own all of this land that you can see and he can chop down all the trees, he can pollute all the rivers, and because he thinks he owns it. You know, so uh, yeah, I'm proud to be a squatter. Um, but basically, mainstream media has given us such bad press, you know, and, and there are messy squatters and young squatters who don't know what they're doing and you know people who, who do create a bit of mess around them but the vast majority of squatters are, are people who are repairing buildings looking after buildings doing them up looking after them in various different ways repairing the electrics the the water repairing the roof repairing the windows repairing the doors making it weatherproof and actually improving a property and looking after it for for the owners until some owners turn up some owners turn up two three months later and some not for two three years and Sometimes it's completely abandoned. In, in the terms that obviously that, that squatting says is that you find an empty, abandoned property, and you know, and then you can utilise it to either make your point about why it's empty, or just because you need somewhere to live. So, I mean, everything just progressed until you know we are here, we're here now. But I mean, there's a lot of people I know that sort of say, you know, they come and ask me advice for things because it's just at the end of the day, I've, I've taken the, the time to kind of work out the best ways to do things and the best ways to approach it, you know, the best ways to talk to your neighbours, the best things to do when you get in, if it's a, if it's a property that's not looking too good, then we go out and paint all the windows by it again and make everything look nice, you know, got a completely overgrown garden, you make it all look nice. And it's, it's not just, it's not for in case the owner comes around and goes, oh, you know, da, 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 you know what you're doing here, oh, actually, you quite, it's, it's mainly because I quite like a nice garden. You know I mean, I quite like nice white windows. I quite like all of this. So why shouldn't I treat this property as if if I cared about it? Because obviously, whoever does it, and it doesn't care about it. So I'll care about it instead. And then you know, maybe if they do turn up, they go, oh, I'm gonna, oh wait a minute, I paint the windows. It looks really nice. Oh, everything's sorted. Maybe I'll try and be a bit nice to these people rather than just being a complete arsehole like a, a lot of people can be. Because they just they they have, they're so blinded to the to the ideals of anything else that's kind of I uh, straight down the line you have to work and you will work till you're fifty and then you might own a house by the end of it if you don't then you'll have a big debt to someone and it's just it's just rubbish basically I mean there's a lot of obviously the the sort of common land laws and that as well there's a lot of land out there that isn't being used and it's just sitting there and you know why why people shouldn't be able to go and you know set their TPs and everything up on on land and stuff like that I don't see I don't see that being a problem really. Um, it's things like that. It's the, it's the moral issues behind what why people have left properties empty that kind of need to be brought up. And the fact that I mean, at the moment, there's um, I'm trying to work out. There's probably one, two, three, four, five, six. There's probably about like eight or nine, if not more, of us at the moment who are actually staying here because I mean, we've had people who were uh, who've been evicted from previous properties. And at the end of the day, you know, a lot of us would actually be on the street. I mean, 
in a way we kind of chose to get into this this sort of world of squatting but it's because we can be uh, a bit more active about it. like i say if, if a place like this ends up we getting evicted but the owner decides to rent it out or he decides to um you know to let somebody live in it or do something then i feel that's that's job achieved or that's it, it varies over the years we are a bit of a housing service yeah because people know we do big community center squats right you know some people just squat in a free four bedroom house and keeping quiet and getting on with it we tend to let lots of people know that we're somewhere and people get in touch with us and say oh my mate's cousin needs a place to live for a few days few weeks is there a spare room you know especially if you take a big place that's got 10 20 so Mace just got a 70 room hotel a little while ago that was empty and uh, you know obviously then people get in touch and say oh you know or well, you put it out on Facebook or something some mates have just got a 20 room place a few spare bedrooms anybody want to get in touch and you know need something or whatever you know I suppose over the years we've probably been responsible for housing thousands and thousands of people. If you add it up, it might be 979 or 1,650 or whatever, but yeah, it's a lot. You know, you come in and either sometimes the electric's already on, you switch, flick switches and it's on, or sometimes people do a bit of work to, to, to get it working again. And then generally it's on for a while. Sometimes the electricity board will turn up and say, you know, you need a key meter or something. So in this place particularly, we they found out day three that we were here with electric and came and fitted us with a key meter at the coldest point of the winter, which is a real pain in the ass. Well, this is the downstairs of the uh, Mortlake uh, System Exchange Social Centre. Uh, it's been open for about two and a half months now, kind of thing. We've had a few workshops, meetings, talks, discussions, and kind of uh, theatre performance, kind of uh, poetry night, kind of thing. Uh, local ladies housewife's uh, 40th birthday and there's about 70 people in here all singing and dancing and uh, so here we are compact and bijou it's uh, one of the smallest uh, centres we've done over years we've got lots of different buildings churches theatres military bases factories uh, houses all different shapes and sizes islands uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah this is this is a smaller version basically but it's been really bloody cold we've been here for the coldest period of january february so there hasn't been actually that many people coming through just because everyone wants to curl up at home around the, around the heat around that, you know. But uh, it's been a nice space. We might get kicked out in the next one, two, three weeks. Been looking for the next one kind of thing. So we we'll go scouting and see what we find. Yeah. Uh, Basically, as soon as they put boards up, it's an advert of saying, hey, the building's empty. No one's looking after it. There's no one in here. So um, basically... You look for signs of dilapidation, rubbish in the front garden, not cleared up, overgrown, you know, stuff. And uh, no lights on or whatever, and uh, boards and stuff. But yeah, generally, you just keep looking, keep looking, and you have a little kind of list in the back of your head. So generally, you've got a, a radar on it, and you know that you're going to go to court in a certain number of weeks, and then after court, it usually takes a certain number of weeks for the bailiffs to come. But, you know, sometimes protests, they don't tell you when they're going to come, or come and rush you quicker than you thought and the worst nightmare is to be sat on it's only happened a few times with me but you know to be sat on, on all your tat on Tuesday morning at 7.15 in the morning and they've just evicted you and you're like shit we didn't get the next place sorted so where are we going next kind of thing about three weeks ago we were at Scott in Holloway Roads and we knew we were getting evicted we got an eviction notice and basically the the court order said we had like legal like occupation of that place till 4.30 in the afternoon. I'm like in a room with a girl, and they say I know about 8.30 in the morning, smash, smash, three hench Polish bailiffs smashing down the door going, we need to do this, we need to do this, like what, what, like still, because of course like we knew we were getting evicted so we're in a massive like eviction party, so everyone's hung over as hell, and they say you know we've got these Polish bloody bailiffs going we need to get out it was like what what's going on and like we had like a massive argument with them like nearly got into a fight and like eventually like they backed down and one of the sort of like it was like one of the older squatters it was like about 30 like called the police and then the police came saw the like court order and basically told the bailiffs to piss off yeah and then sometimes there can be that absolute panic when you know you've got to move out of somewhere because you've been evicted and uh, you've got the heavies outside your door, like 20 Polish builders who can't wait to get into your building and you're crying your eyes out because you don't know where you're going to live next and you've got loads and loads and loads of stuff and you won't shed so many tears if you haven't got so much stuff. It's just like travel light.
I mean, I've been in positions before where the police don't even know what a section six is, and you've got, and I've had to kind of like close a window on an officer, and he's going, right, I'm coming in, that, and he's going, no, 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 you go and speak to your sergeant about this bit of paper, and then come back and talk to me. And then, like two minutes later, his sergeant's come round the corner, gone, right, you go, I'll speak to these guys, and because he's aware of what's going on, you talk to them, just go, look, you know, obviously you're squatting, we need somewhere to live. Um, um, you know, there's, there's nothing happening here. Nothing's been damaged. You can have a look around the property. We don't mind. But at the end of the day, like you know, this is now a civil matter between us and the landlord or the, or the property owner. So it's, it's fine. But uh, most of the time, they seem to be quite cool with it. The majority of squatters, I, I'd say, are either just keeping quiet or will actually do places up and are trying to use them constructively. Squatting, uh, you have some issues sometimes with the uh, law enforcement. I mean, generally. Uh, they're supposed to remain neutral. Squatting is a civil matter, not a criminal matter. Uh, basically, we've got squatting is legal, and you can legally, if you find a window open, a door open, go in and, and squat a building. Uh, the police can get involved if they think you've caused damage. Uh, generally, you, if you have had to cause any damage on entry, you clear it up really quickly. But you know, generally, some point in the first three, four days, you get what we call first contact, which is generally the police first, sometimes the owners, but. Um, the police will come round and uh, you know say what you're doing here, and you say as long as you know your rights, and you say well we're squatting, it's a legal matter, it's civil, we haven't caused any damage on entry, and you're very quick about telling them that. Um, generally, they just report back to base and say yeah, there's some squatters in it, tick the box. And as long as they look round, they can't see any immediate damage, then off they go. But you know, over the years, sometimes they'll police officers who don't know the law will try and push the law and say get out you can't be in this house and it's like no we've got rights we know our rights uh, and sometimes they'll try and kick the door in or throw you out particularly when there's you know some squatters who don't know their rights or international squatters who don't speak English so well the police sometimes will try and push push the boundaries kind of thing um, I've been evicted early hours in the morning by police and men in black and blah 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 and this that and the other and uh, you know it does happen like that and the worst one like I say is you know when you get evicted unexpectedly generally you try and get another place opened up as soon as you know that you've got possession order happened on the last one and you've got to find a new place to live kind of thing. Uh, generally police you know if you're reasonable and friendly talk to them from a high up window and the doors all barricaded you're generally all right you just say sorry mate you can't come in. Like some really good, good friend of my Meg, who's a wicked artist. Like she does a lot of performance art, and she's very into paganism, Wicca, and other types of um, performance. She was living there with Elvis over there, and a lot of other performers and artists um, used to go around. Um, they put on some good parties sometimes, uh, they got kicked out, like everywhere eventually gets evicted. It just happened that there's people cared about that one because of the situation where it was placed. Like, I don't know, did it belong to a bank or something? But it's in a very expensive part of London and people are actually horrified that some grotty artists could live there for free. Um, with electricity and water sometimes we register with the electricity and water board and pay for the electricity sometimes we don't uh, it just varies from house to house depends also on how long you think you're going to live there for like if, in my last place in the mansion i lived there for about a year and a half and we set up arrangements with the water and electricity board because we knew it was a permanent place Marks and Spencer skips really good. We just well, Will just went to the skip, New Covent Garden skip, to get loads of vegetables and fruit. Dragon fruit, mm -hmm. because it reminds me of the female sexual organs. <laughs> Going to the G. I heard you guys failing the day, so I'm really good. Oh yeah, um, yeah, it's alright. Just 
just like jamming a few Pogue songs and um, yeah. Oh. Peeped out by like, four big heavies turning up at the door and like the police did not give a fuck, just didn't want to do anything. Um, Like, it's completely dirty, like, the fact that this place is a hundred times better than my actual house. Like, when I was living at my parents' house, like, there's not many places you can go that have a real lion rug in, in the lounge. Like, you can't really say it's a complete hellhole when there's a lion rug. Cambridge is probably the weirdest person to live with. Uh, it's a gentleman, he, he was calling himself Marley. Now, he was a speed freak, basically. He really liked speed, and... I don't even know how to explain how weird he was because he he'd been staying in the property because we'd had the, we got given the keys to this old pub basically um, that that closed down and he kind of jumped in there about two days before us um, <coughs> knowing that we were going to move in anyway he kind of just decided I oh, stuff it I'm going to get in first anyway and we'd heard kind of you know he liked his speed and that a little bit and we were like, okay well but he, he just he just went completely bonkers and the stuff like you wouldn't see him for two days and then he'd be up at like four o'clock in the morning just doing he'd have like blue on his hands and stuff and he'd just be like oh, it's a bit weird and then you'd, you'd see like a there'd be a wine glass with a cd with like a another see through thing stacked on top of it underneath a light and he'd just it'd just a really weird kind of like opening up into dimensional portals and stuff and then things would start going missing and he'd just be like this is really weird things are going missing all that and then it took us so long to work out that we had a load of blue printer cartridges big ones kind of thing and it took, I don't know why it took us so long to realise the reason he was had blue hands <coughs> was to nick the cartridges and things like that anyway so like he's gone out one day and we've just we've given him like five or six chances just to stop being weird not just being weird but like being really weird and really kind of you know upsetting a few people by his actions and we really were suspecting that these things are going missing were was something to do with him so he's we kind of you know we wouldn't let him in one day and say look mate you need to go away for 24 hours until we work out what's going on we're not saying you can't come back we just need to work this all out cause open his room up his entire bedroom floor to ceiling was just blue his mattress was blue everything was painted blue and there were just piles of stuff piles of just random things and you go oh right there's my mate's mobile phone knackered covered in blue oh there's the walkman and just everything was in his room he just like he'd hoarded everything and taken it and painted it all blue and like just everything was blue and then you'd go oh my god there's needles there right no that's it he's not coming like we've told him you know what i mean he, I don't okay he can be his own person do what he wants but he keeps it all away but we found too many bits and pieces around the place as well and just like no we need to get rid of the guy but he was really weird just like I just, I just can't even you know like pouring the washing up liquid into pint glasses with like crystals in the bottom and then kind of turn them upside down on plates and then having lights and just all sorts of really really weird kind of <laughs> stuff and he's just talking about uh, I don't know like I think he'd done a bit too much or whatever it was basically and he just got a bit bonkers and it, unfortunately you just can't live with people like that. you know the, every four or five other people in the house were really cool. You know what I mean? We had no problems with each other, you know, we'd have a, we had our own little VIP bar upstairs, we'd all sit around drinking, like, you know, get a couple of kegs of ale in, just sit there, and it'd just be being really weird, and kind of, you'd just see him disappear into a doorway, and then come back again, just all blue, and just like, oh, it's really weird to me out, man. So we kind of just had to go, look, mate, no disrespect, but if you've got any stuff, I can't tell if you've got any stuff, because it's just in amongst all of this crap, but you can't, you can't stay here, mate, you really can't, because you just... You jumped in before, like you know. I mean, you knew we were going to be coming in. We could, you know, could have been all cool, but you decided to jump the gun anyway, and you've just weirded everyone out and just been a complete nutter. And I'm sorry, but you you need to go somewhere. You need some help, and we can't help you. So that yeah, he was probably the weirdest character I've ever lived with. It's really weird. We're just like you, you know. I I did actually probably earn more than you when I was your when you were my age and stuff like that. And I was probably working a lot, but now. I've changed the way I want to do things. I want to. I want to try and promote the idea that we don't have to be kind of against each other all the time. So it's just mainly that sort of thing. I mean, what's the uh, what's the old joke? Uh, why do anarchists like herbal herbal tea? Because proper tea is theft.
our section six printed on uh, some recycled paper from our last spot and a printer that we found. Some other like little kids kind of said over when we when we moved to this place. It's a little like um, Eleni, isn't it? Rob. <laughs> they were living there, turning into some little like methadone home. Um, let me get the paper. Eh? Oh, no. it's, like, it's like you go through a lot of shit places before you find something good, and then you go through a spell where you get a good place, up a good place, up a good place. Yeah. More like it was alright, but you're like bath and shit here. 